Way to get comfortable. Mm -hmm. All right, as everybody's joining, getting settled in, we're so thankful you're here. Will you go ahead and type in the chat your name and where you're from, where you're zooming in from? It's always nice to know. Give everybody a chance to get their microphones turned on or turned off, depending as the case may be. Oh, I see some familiar friends out there. Good to see you, good to see you. Ireland. Hey, somebody's up late tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii, Germany, all right, been to Oregon. Lots of North Carolina. Hey, Lauren, coming to my workshop. That's right, I see you. Well, oh, this is I saw London, Ontario. Robin, I did not know you were from Hawaii. That's good to know. Um, I'm recognizing some of these folks from, we've been chatting about Patreon this week quite a bit. And so I, I see several names going by that I know we've been chatting. So it's good to see you here. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for typing in, letting us know where you are, who you are. And I hope you're having a good day. We are here today with a very special guest. You probably know her as the Zero Waste Chef and I will let her introduce herself in just a moment. Um, but first we, we wanted to check, kind of do a temperature check and check in with y'all on your thoughts about zero waste. Because as makers and crafters, we've all got extra things that we're holding on to and we have no idea what to do with. For me, I have a little jar, I should have gotten it for us. I have a jar of all the extra threads that I snip off of my long arm quilting, you know, cause you always have extra. And I just keep stuffing them down in there and I have no idea what to do with those threads. What are you holding on to that you, you have no idea what to do with? Would you type that in the chat please so we can get some ideas? Well, I'll just interject myself because I was telling them before we started, it's absolutely buttons, buttons for me. I have them in just <laughs> jars and, and bins and shelves and just every, I never ever in my life have used a button. I mean, I've used a button if it's on a shirt, but I've never added a button to anything, but I've kept buttons from, uh, I think I'm looking about 5,000 pounds of clothes that I've gone through to make quilts out of. I have almost all the buttons from all of that. And if I used a single one, not a, not a one. <laughs> Heidi, what about you? What do you hold on to that you don't know what to do with? I think these little circle things inside of my thread. I did, I did recycle some a while ago, but now I've got a new stash building up and I keep thinking that I will think of something like darling to make with them, but I've not, I'm just keeping them. You can always do what I do when I'm stuck with something and have no other use for it. You just make a holiday ornament out of it. You just yeah. Little... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope everyone learned that in kindergarten, right? It's a good trick. And Marie, what about you? What do you have sitting around that you're like, what do I do with this? Like fabric wise. So I have a little group of people and we sew produce bags and give them away at the farmer's market. So I have a box full of little scraps of fabric and I can only make so many of these little cushions, <laughs> which I'm sitting on right now. <laughs> so um, anyway, I can, I can talk more about that later, but that's, yeah, I mean, I, it's a pretty big box. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we know what that's like having the stuff. And what do you do with it? There's some, I, you'll probably recognize, if you've been reading what other participants are saying, you probably recognize something you're holding on to and don't know what to do with. Hopefully, there'll be time after the presentations for us to share ideas about things that you're doing at home that you that are just genius, that need to be shared out, right? Mm -hmm. So be thinking about what's, what's something you're expert in that you can share with this, this group here tonight. But first, let's go to a round robin of, I'll introduce myself and we'll bop around and then we'll start the conversation tonight. If you don't know me, I'm Zach Foster. I make modern quilts out of repurposed materials. So this topic of zero waste is one that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of work with memory quilts and burial quilts, you've probably seen that. And super lately, I have started a Patreon community where people can get together to join a sewing circle once a month or small creative cohorts or even one-on-one -on -one consultations. So that's what I've been up to. And that's it's nice to have you here tonight. Heidi? Beautiful. Um, I am Heidi Parks. I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am a quilter and an artist. And 
I do a lot of teaching quilting, especially hand piecing and hand quilting. Um, I exhibit, I am right now in an exhibition in Seoul in South Korea. So very excited about that international show. And that's a little about me, Luke. So I am an architect, a recovering architect, I like to say, a uh, turned quilter, um, same as Heidi, I exhibit. Um, I have a quilt up behind me so you can kind of see some of what I do. I'll talk a little bit about, about that when it gets to be my turn later. Um, but I'm living in Kansas City and uh, work almost exclusively with reclaimed clothing, textiles, materials to kind of give a, an existing story uh, another life. Anne-Marie? Uh, hi, my name is Anne-Marie Bonneau and I write a blog, The Zero Way Chef, and I have a book, the same name. Um, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I'm from Canada, um, originally near Toronto. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Anne-Marie, for being here. And Heidi and Luke, it's always good to see you. Um, I would like to start off tonight with a quilt that I made that kind of overlaps in a Venn diagram kind of way, two things. So I will share my screen. Here we go. Ah. So this is one of my new headshots that I just got last week. I'm feeling pretty cute oh, about it. Oh, very nice. <laughs> and I should say that I just noticed I didn't use the edited version. You'll see that this shirt, a favorite of mine, has the elbow worn out and I haven't mended it yet. I've mended this one. This one, you can see the patch on, but that so that just shows you I'm dedicated to, to this cause here, right? Not throwing anything away that could be good for something else. So this quilt is one I love to talk about because it's my spoon quilt. And I've never made, a, I had never made a quilt like this before nor since. But one thing I do quite a bit is when I travel, I like to look for found fabrics as I go. And so I was in Mexico, this would have been 2016 or so. 18. And I'd been collecting these scraps of fabrics, you know, I'd stay with different people and they would give me things like that hot pink ribbon you see in the background that came from the lady who I stayed with at one point. And while I was hand sewing all these pieces together, you can see the quilt and the hand sewn stitches in the background. I was also noticing as I was walking around Guanajuato, Mexico and San Miguel de Allende, if you're familiar, all these plastic ice cream spoons that are called disposable, which is a super misnomer. Um, you can't throw them away, but there is no away. I forget who said that, but I like it. Um, and I found myself just getting irritated, not with people, but mostly with the corporations and the businesses that make these spoons and they make them in bright colors and they shape them to look like toys. Like you see one right there, that pink one with the dinosaur head on top. I mean, they look like fun, festive, inviting things, but they're things that are gonna be on this planet for at least 500 years. Who knows, plastic's only been around for about 75 years so far. So we don't have actual data on that. But I went around those two towns as I was in Mexico that summer, and I was just picking up spoons. I would take them back to the, where I was staying and wash them, of course, da, da, da. And I just started to sew them on top of this travel quilt that I was making. And it began to take on a significance for me because the spoons were getting so heavy on the front that you could no longer see the, the patchwork behind it. You can no longer see that beautiful quilt behind it. And it, it is a really nice hand-sewn quilt. And I think there's, uh, there's a message in there for us, right? That we need to reflect on our, our methods, of our, our habits of consumption and think about what are we doing with all these things that come through our lives and pass through our hands, right? Is also, the only quilt I've ever made that's acoustic. And I'd like to play you a five second video to give you a taste of that. Ah, just like a little wind chime or something. I love that. What else I got for you? All right. Those spoons don't get out very often. They like to, they like to play. Okay, another idea. Here's my cute French friend, Simone, and we worked on a farm together a couple years ago, and he's volunteered to hold up this quilt for me. I'll show you. There it is laid out. You can tell it's made out of two pieces of fabric, two old bed sheets, a blue and a tan one, 
and the back was backed with this sarong that a friend of my partner's brought back to us from the Philippines. When I backed this quilt, I had to cut off the remnants, right? The, the, the edging around the, the quilt top itself. And I didn't want to waste them. So they went into this next quilt. And I tried to, if you can make it out, rearrange the strips in a way that mm, connected to their original arrangement. I tried to reconstruct the, the sarong in, in a way. Um, in the middle are other pieces of other backings of other quilts, right? So that's why they're all long strips. And I'm showing you this not because it's such a great quilt. I mean, it's, it's cool or whatever, but um, I have started since then, when I trim a quilt sandwich and I got those long pieces left over, instead of putting them back in my normal stash with all the other fabrics, I have been began keeping those uh, the long pieces wrapped up in separate so that when I need binding for a future quilt, I already know where my long pieces are. Because you know, if you work with bolt fabric, it's easy to get those straight line pieces. You just, they're already, they're already long and straight. But when you work with repurposed material and you have random sleeves and cuffs and you know, shirt parts, um, it can be hard to get a long length of fabric. So I've been holding on to those, the, the backing strips that often come from bed sheets just for that purpose. And that's been nice to have that separate box fabric. That's one practical tip for you. I think I got another one. Mm -hmm. It's thunderstorming here in Brooklyn. And I think that's interfering with. Here we go. Here's another tip. And this is, listen, I, I'm not inventing any of this stuff, but this is a hand tied quote. And a, uh, a routine, a melody that I fall into when I hand tie is I try to tie the ties <laughs> about three to four inches apart. One is, I think that's just a, a nice visual distance, but two, when I snip the thread in the middle, so if I were to cut it right through here, for example, I already cut it right through here, that would give me just enough thread here and just enough thread here to tie into a knot. And so there is zero waste at that point. My good friend, Elio Hernandez, Heidi introduced me to him and I'm so glad I know him. He taught me how to take out um, the, the chain stitch from a pair of jeans. There's a chain stitch in the waist and there's a chain stitch down the inseam of a pair of jeans. And denim companies typically use really wonderful, there we go, really wonderful thread, right? It's gonna be strong, it's sturdy. As you can see in this picture, I like using it to sign my quilts. Another idea that I do with the encouragement of Heidi, thank you Heidi, shout out. Um, and you know, Heidi, you're wondering what to do with those plastic spools, you could just start wrapping your your ripped up jeans, jean thread, right? Oh, maybe use them as a new spool. You can continue there being a spool. I like that. That is one idea. Like if, if something is still perfectly serviceable, maybe we should try to keep it in the same service, right? So an old spool could become a new spool for a thread that you find or thread that you dye, right? Buttons could become buttons for something else, maybe a journal or maybe another garment of clothing. Okay, the last tidbit, Oh no, I have two more, two more tidbits. I'm just gonna shout out for organic silhouettes on quilts. You can see that this quilt is basically square-ish. Um, I consider this to be, I like it for a lot of reasons, but I'm talking about it with zero waste because why cut off perfectly good fabric that could keep you warm, right? Look at all this that you would lose if you were to try to square it up, right? So not only would you lose kind of that visual appeal, because I think there's some really nice, mm, there's a really nice flow happening here, kind of a delta is what I see. So not only would you lose kind of that vis visual flow of that delta shape, but you would lose actual fabric that could keep you warm and cozy. So when you think about zero waste, think about the silhouette of your quilt as well. And then last but not least, and then Heidi, I'm batting it over to you. Um, I have done some natural dyes in the last couple of years. Now, I remember when I first started that I was like, oh, I got to get cotton muslin. And for some reason, I felt like I had to get brand new cotton muslin. And I was doing it just, I was following my instructions, you know, about how to scour it and wash it, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm like, Zach, what are you doing about all this new fabric? You haven't bought new fabric in five years. And so this quilt is made entirely out of old <laughs> white bed sheets. Um, when you dye old bed sheets, of course, you're bound to find surprises. There's going to be some spots and some stains along the way, but that's all part of the story, right? And you put something to good use. So I'm going to leave you with this. And without further ado, 
med side effects. Thank you, Zach. Uh, that white quilt is such a favorite of mine from you. I remember you made that right around when we first connected and became friends on Instagram and the black batting that you used or you dyed or you found in that white quilt is part of what inspired me to do some transparently layered quilts, which I'm going to talk about in my presentation. So, yeah, right. so remind us what, what that batting is. I would just say, yeah, I just want to add into that since you brought it up that um, the, the squares that look blue there are really just a sheer white. And so my friend Ashton, who's no longer on Instagram, he's out of here, but he came to visit one day and he helped me dye this with black walnut dye. So the, the batting was actually dyed dark and that helps you see the seams. If you look really close, it looks like stained glass because you can see the white borders on each of the squares. That's just a seam allowance that the dark batting has allowed to reflect and shine through. Yeah. Oh, I love that quilt so much. It's a beautiful one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am going to share my screen. Poor Luke, that's a little sign of things to come on there. You recognize that, I bet. Okay, slideshow, play. Okay, so thinking about waste, this is a photo of the cedar chest where I store a lot of my scraps and my waste that I want to remember. So it's, uh, in a nice, beautiful chest right here in this room that I'm zooming from so that I think about it and remember to use those scraps. But I got lots of little pieces of fabric and yarn and tiny tidbits in there. I also notoriously have, because I like the same kind of quilt border that Zach likes, where it's not a perfect square, I, and I don't baste real tight. I baste about once every 12 inches. I end up with these little two or three inch strips of batting and backing from every quilt that I make. I have these long skinny strips. So that is the waist from the back of an ordinary five foot by five foot quilt. Be also because of Zach, you were posting your ball jar on Instagram years and years ago. And I thought I should do that too because I've just been throwing all my tails and my tiny little scraps in the garbage. So now I have them. And into the cedar chest goes all the, sometimes I'll dump the jar into the chest and have to figure it out later. But some of the things I don't know what to do with that are waste is what happens when my rotary cutter is old and chipped and doesn't cut right? What do I do with that metal? Generally, I put tape around it so no one cuts themselves and I pop it in the garbage. But this one was just sitting around because apparently I felt too guilty to throw it away. And now it's just taking up space in my sewing area. Same goes for needles and pins that are bent or that aren't sharp. Sometimes when you buy a pack of 100, you get one in there that isn't a sharpened point, as well as my wonder clips. As I talked about, my little spool in there, as well as the little paper card. And I feel real passionate about protecting my fingers when I'm sewing, but I end up then with this silicon that I'm using as a gripper. And some of the silicon tends to, especially if I have any kind of lotion or anything on my hands, or if it's just been in use for a year from the oils from my fingers, it starts to uh, dissolve the rubber and it gets tacky and sticky and it creates a stickiness on my finger and my fabric and I cannot use it for its intended purpose anymore. The little hole that rips into the top doesn't bother me, but that sticky stuff, big problem, as well as all of the packaging that I have from the tools that I buy. So uh, one solution that I found for some of my kitchen waste is to use nat some natural dye. So here I like to store and dry onion skins, avocado pits and peels, and then I put these into, uh, into use. For a while, I used to freeze my grounds from the coffee that I like to make. And now I just dry them out. I either air dry them on this pan or sometimes I'll pop them in the oven briefly. And 
you're going to see a little view of my coffee grounds and the fabric I dyed with them. But when I'm dyeing things, I do generally start with fabric from the store. I have had some bad experiences working with bed sheets because of a high thread count. So I know I need to, if I use bed sheets, I need to check that I can draw my needle through it because if it's too high a thread count, that's a problem. So these examples are done with unbleached cotton muslin and I heat the dye stuff and then I strain out the solids. Maybe I add some salt that uh, helps with dye and then I will put it on the stove and I'll heat everything up for about two hours. And I'm always pre-wetting my fabric so that it can go into that dye pot a little easier. And I'll usually leave it on the stove overnight because it's real hard to take super hot fabric out of the dye pot and do anything with it. So I'll just let it keep soaking up the dye overnight, let it cool down. And then I'll put it in the sink or the bathtub and wring it out and then let it air dry. And then, I've got you know, these beautiful colors and usually the finished fabric doesn't turn out exactly that vibrant, but to keep as much of the color as possible, after I let it air dry, I heat set it by adding, uh, putting it in the tumble dryer or by ironing it, applying heat. And then I also like to time set. And I just think about all the rules involved in getting a stain out of something. I think about that in reverse. So if you're supposed to wash something right away, if you get a stain, to put a stain in, to dye something, let it sit a while. And then I wash and dry it like normal and start sewing and I get beautiful fabrics. These are some of the naturally dyed fabric things with scraps that I've encountered. Uh, here I am sewing with some of those fabric scraps. Here's a quilt I made, it's or not scraps, but naturally dyed from food scraps and yard waste. And this one, I don't normally include other people's art, but here I've got some artist shit. And that is from Piero Manzoni. And it's real famous work of art, just canned, you know, it's made from an artist and you can buy it. So it must be special. And I have a series that I made with, um, you know, something that is waste, from my body. And I don't put a bunch of feminine products in the garbage anymore. I use a diva cup and then I have this little cup full of very brightly colored material. And I started to use that as dye and I follow all the same rules, except I wash it a bunch more at that last phase as with the food waste. But I think it's really interesting, both from an artist's point of view, following this work of Piero Manzoni to use part of my body to make my art in this really literal way. You'll also notice there are a lot of strips in here and those are strips from trimming the backing on some of my other quilts. So I love how I took advantage of one of those corner pieces from trimming the backing in the corner of this quilt. I also used batting scraps. I chopped them up tiny and used them as trapunto to go into this 3D area of this quilt. And I used tea to dye things. Tea is another wonderful um, source of natural dye. I used a combination of dandelion root, green tea, matcha green tea, uh, things that you know, are spent tea rather than fresh. Here I am in an art exhibition uh, here in Milwaukee in November at the Portrait Society Gallery. This is another one of my bodily waste quilts. And another scrap, of course, is fabric scraps. And I love the idea of using the scrap in the shape that it arrived in. And during our last sustainable sewing talk, I talked about this quilt behind me and how one of these scraps was in the shape it was when I found it. And this collaboration with Joe Cunningham, we purposefully wanted to use only found and repurposed things. And I did not alter these scraps from the shape they were in when I found them. Joe likes to joke that this is a pair of underpants in here. <laughs> Uh, the double happiness exhibition that I'm in in Korea right now was inspired by sustainable sewing. They had a lot of leftover scraps from uh, some workshops that they held and they thought, what could we do with all of these? We can't sell them as yardage because they're just little one foot by one foot pieces. 
And they thought we'll invite seven international artists and we'll mail them scraps and have them make something. And it's a really exciting exhibition that I'm in now. And this is that idea that I got from looking at that white quilt from Zach is the layering of a transparent fabric on top because then you can put as teensy tiny little bitty scraps as you want. And I always get a lot of questions on what fabrics I use for that. And my only test is I put my hand under it. And if I can see my hand, it's a go. Um, I suppose the other important test is can my needle go through it? If it's too tight of a weave, if it's gonna hurt my body to sew with, then I wouldn't bother. Uh, for that same exhibition, I also made these vases. They have a glass bottle from the recycling bin wrapped in these strips of batting. And then I used the scraps from making the quilt with the scraps to make the bottle beautiful. And what I love is that it can hold water as well. So because of that glass interior. Those thread tails. I keep in my ball jar. Here they are just underneath some silk organza. To me, this feels very Jackson Pollock, kind of a beautiful splatter. And I love how that piece turned out. Here I'm using my thread for trapunto. So instead of using cotton batting scraps, here I've put actual little tiny tails of thread underneath, in this case, an open weave cotton to create some trapunto. Here you can see how 3D that is. It's a big close up of a six inch by six inch quilt, but it, you can really get very three dimensional with Trapunto. This is a collaboration that I am working on with Luke. So I did this in 2017. I'm hoping he will do take his turn and finish it soon. Uh, but this was a big aha moment for me. And I'm so grateful to have worked on this collaboration because I, I tend to love other people's work that is a little rough and loose and messy looking. And I have a habit of being very neat and tidy and precise and clean. And I need to push myself to be able to make the kind of art that I really like to look at, which has that rougher look to it. So uh, you avoid the thread tail problem entirely if you leave the thread tail on the quilt. And I think it creates a really painterly effect, like the drips that could be in an Andy Warhol or a Jackson Pollock painting. So here's this piece. We are all mending and destroying and mending and destroying as we send it, mailed it from one to the other. These are some skinnier strips, but it's that same idea, those skinny little strips from trimming something up. Um, here, they're underneath the transparent fabric. This is a technique called quilt as you go. So I just quilted, I pieced everything on the batting. And that's why you don't see quilting lines across the top of this. Um, little bits and pieces, why not throw them in the quilt? <laughs> my pajama pants are in this piece behind me as well, those little bits that were getting eaten by my heel. Uh, I'm using them visually, but if you're just worried about being environmentally friendly, getting rid of that stuff, why not sprinkle a little bit between the backing and the batting and give it a nice home to live in? So here are a lot of little cut up pieces of fabric and you can see that dramatic difference of the transparent scrim over the top and then the finished work of art, which I think has really beautiful ghostly quality to it because of that layering. It also makes all the colors go together. I think it's kind of garish without that transparent. I wouldn't have naturally wanted to do something that bright, but it just mellowed everything out, made it work together very beautifully as one layer with the transparent layer. Here, we have got some more long skinny strips finding a home. So here's some long skinny strips that I used to make courthouse steps and then appliqued. Uh, here's some long skinny strips that I hand pieced together. I actually broke out my sewing machine. I haven't used it much in the last five years or so. But for this, I thought, how fun to just sit next to that cedar chest, plow through with my sewing machine, use up some of those strips. So here I am making use of my sewing machine and my cedar chest. And um, some of these haven't been attached to a quilt yet, but now at least they look more like yardage and something interesting. And I think it's more likely that I'll use them than as those little bits 
that were in the chest. It can be a great practice to just go through your scraps and just piece them into yardage and then see what they become. Uh, so that is what I've got on the subject of waste. I was worried I had over 40 slides, but I think I stayed on time, team. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi, I've always loved about your quilts that you, your biography are, is in your quilts. Mm -hmm. You, your life, your body in some, in some cases are in your quilts. And I have always admired that about your work. Mm, thank you very much. All right, beautiful. Over to Luke. All right, guys. Well, so I am going to do a little bit different today. And I am going to, rather than showing uh, images, I figured it's perfect because I'm in my studio and I'm making a large portrait. So you can kind of see um, in process uh, uh, where I'm, I'm working, um, but also talking about sort of zero waste and, and sort of you can see kind of what I do with some of these clothing. So I'm gonna grab my phone here. We're gonna go on a, uh, a journey around the studio. Uh, normally I don't love to show what my studio looks like uh, when I'm in the middle of a project because it looks like this. And you can see here, I'm laying out the gradient of the clothing that I'm using. Uh, that's gonna be that portrait of myself right here. It's gonna be uh, kind of similar to this, only 20 feet tall. Um, but I wanted to show you this guy right here uh, and get up really, really darn close so you can see what it's made out of. And, and kind of wanting to talk a lot about what Heidi was talking about, which is the story. So I use a lot of reclaimed clothing. Um, in this case, it's entirely from Goodwill. Um, and I'll show you a quilt in just one second that is all my own clothing, but I just think it's so beautiful because there's such a story here. Like this is a little pair of Dr. Pepper jammy pants and this was a, a tote bag and you know something super floral, but it all kind of comes together to create a, a much larger story. And so, you know, one of the things for me to sort of talk about and just shove in there in terms of zero waste. Luke, we might've lost you, buddy. We wanna hear Luke. <laughs> Not all studios have the best Wi-Fi reception. Mm -hmm. That might be. Yeah, well, he was doing fine until he started moving. So hopefully he will come back. Uh, these, these quilts I know he shared before about how he buys the fabric from Goodwill by the pound. So he goes to the special Goodwill where you buy in bulk like that. And Luke for a long time was not teaching classes on how to do that kind of photographic process that he has. And now that is a class that he's teaching in his Luke University classes. So it's pretty extraordinary to have the opportunity to learn that from him. And he has kicked out now. So hopefully he will rejoin. It's not a power problem. Shall we move over to Anne Marie and then have Luke rejoin when he's back? Sounds good. We, you know what, there is a question in the chat. Uh, Marilyn has asked, as quilters, do we send our scraps and thread pieces to communities at risk to make quilts? I don't know if that's something you have experience with, Heidi. Um, but one, th oh, and then Stephanie says that she donates excess yardage to local arts programs, which is brilliant, wonderful. Give anything you can to education. Yeah. We need it. I think um, it's such um, more appreciated as a donation to get yardage than to get little tiny scraps. I think some places uh, it can be so hard for them to navigate as beginners. Uh, I, the, the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Art that's near me here in Cedarburg, Wisconsin has an annual rummage and they get donation. I'm, pa I'm packing things up to donate, but they don't take scraps. They just take yardage, but there's certain yardage that's a color or something that I'm not going to use anymore. So I donate it to the museum. And then I also go and I buy stuff, <laughs> really great stuff and give them some money. And then at the end, any of the yardage that doesn't sell, they have a process for donating that very thoughtfully um, 
at the end. So there may be other spaces like that that do that. There is. I just recently learned that our friend Kim Soper, Feel Good Fibers. Sorry, guys. Been... <gasps> Welcome back. <gasps> just to finish this thought, Luke, and then we'll go back to you. But Feel Good Fibers allows people to sell yardage that they have, but don't think they'll be able to use. So it's a way for you to make a couple bucks if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Feel good fibers, sell your yardage. Okay, Luke, welcome back. We missed you. Thanks, guys. So it turns out it's too hot in my studio, and my phone said uh, it's too hot, <laughs> and I'm just going to shut down. Uh, maybe too hot to handle. I don't know. Um, but um, so who knows what that's all about? Uh, thanks, thanks as always for your technology patience. And I want to interject uh, a little thing just to kind of say uh, what you guys said, you know, finding, um, here, I'm going to point at me, uh, finding kind of avenues for your own, your own scraps. So uh, one thing that I find is really helpful is to engage your community. I mean, we've got, oh my God, you know, access to everyone in the world now. So you just say, dear Instagram, I've got this thing. Do you want a thousand buttons? Do you want this great fabric? Do you want this sheet? Whatever your whatever your scrap is, um, I definitely remember access to some folks who said, you know, I just use all this crap for cat beds, and they do cat beds for their local shelter. So even the stuff that I personally wouldn't use, they want. They just shove it in a little pillow, etc. So I uh, just you know engage your community if you're working on zero waste. Um, and I'll I'll show a little bit more. Uh, so this this quilt here is one that I made out of my own clothing. Um, so it, this is the stuff that I was getting rid of. So, you know, zero waste, uh, you know, just kind of saying, okay, how do I take my own story and, and put it together into this object? And so I sewed all of my own clothing together and then cut it apart and sewed it together and put it all back together uh, to make this, this kind of self-portrait, a la Heidi, uh, you know, just kind of portrait of my own story. But one of the things I wanted to show you guys, obviously this quilt, which I really like, but these little kind of artifacts that came from that larger story, I think are really engaging as well. So, you know, you get these kind of art begets art begets art, you know, kind of how Heidi has all these bits from other things, how Zach's talking about how he's engaged with uh, the material from a project, which sort of starts to uh, snowball. I wanted to kind of show a little bit of this. Um, and also just, I mean, look, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and air my dirty laundry in, in a very real way because like, look, at, <laughs> you know, these are these are shirts that are gonna go in that thing. And this is a pile of, of scrap laundry from the Goodwill. But, you know, also, you know, I've got these, these shelves full of all of these partially done projects that, that um, I, you know, I've come together and what's really, really wonderful if you actually use them is, is taking them and saying, okay, what can I do from these extras? Uh, and you could start to kind of, you know, sew them together. My friend, Joe Cunningham always says, um, you know, he doesn't know what to do with a quilt. The first thing he does is cut the fabric in half. So you've got this idea that taking the fabric as the kind of generation point, you know, taking the fabric as the beginning of the story and not necessarily um, interjecting your own story on it. You take the fabric and you say, okay, what can the fabric tell me? Or just cutting it apart and sewing it back together and you get these kind of um, it, it conversations. But, um, you know, so, so just to kind of iterate, reiterate, et cetera, about zero waste, you know, this, the, you get this great opportunity of working with your own material. But uh, the way that I like to think about it is that kind of, um, uh, I, I, there's a there's a there's a term I think you sort of you buy other people's waste you can pay for your you can pay for your carbon footprint to go away by investing in some like um uh you know a renewable energy so I feel like a little bit of that you know I don't mind throwing away a couple of uh, uh sleeves and cuffs every once in a while because I'm using clothing that just wouldn't have been used otherwise you know it's coming from goodwill it's going to kind of the landfill, etc. So I'm using all of this clothing that's got holes, scraps, dirt, um, you know, missing cuffs, which you can absolutely mend if it's your own, but if it's someone else's garment that maybe doesn't fit you, you can take that and repurpose it. Um, and I know we talked about repurposing last time, but that sort of zero waste thing, you know, gets to extend horizontally, right? You get to kind of say, 
you know, there's these other things, kind of like Zach collects all of the detritus from the streets of New York or wherever he goes. Thank you, Zach, for being our, our global garbage man. Um, but we can also do that too. We've got a lot of, oh man, we've got, we as a culture, we as a, well, we as a me have a lot of extra clothing that I have either outgrown or ungrown, or uh, I just actually uh, went through my suit closet and got rid of I don't, 10, 15 suits that I haven't worn. And I don't, I mean, I just don't have that many weddings to go to and I don't have to be that uh, dapper and impressive anymore. I mean, maybe two. So I've got all of this kind of um, garmentry. So zero waste, great, but also, zero waste becomes conversation. It becomes the kind of generative point for, for us to start these conversations. Um, and even like this project here behind my sewing machine, this, this quilt behind it is a scrap quilt. I mean, a hundred plus years old, the dyes that were used in it have started to degrade the fabric itself. It's falling apart. Uh, so I quilt, I rebacked it and quilted the whole thing heavily to hold everything together and to put another little image on top of it. But it gets to be this great conversation, right? This zero waste conversation between me and something that was on its way out now gets to flip right back around and, you know, be part of a, a show, an exhibition. Uh, I mean, functional. It sort of depends on where your makery is. If you like to be an exhibitor or a a shower or a maker or, a, you know, just making quilts for, for function. You can take, you know, little bits of your own stuff, sew them together and um, start a, a conversation with, with something that all, almost seems uninteresting, unusable, your own kind of uh, scraps and bits. Now you get to have a conversation with, gosh, how far can I go? Can I use all of those little bits and pieces and, and to try this? And, and there's plenty of, um, artists to look to, um, you know, certainly Heidi and Zach are wonderful examples of this, but um, across the world, I mean, you know, Zero Waste Chef, which I'm so excited to hear all of these stories and ask a myriad questions uh, and Marie so that we can um, start to talk about this sort of cross pollinations from kitchen to, to studio and, and kind of see ideas and, and share ideas for how to use resources that might seem otherwise like trash. So I'm going to, send it on and um, say thank you. Luke, I've got to ask a question about the piece with the balloon animal over your shoulder. The background yeah. of that, what is the story on that? Is that something that you over dyed or what? Actually, is no, let's, let's go on a little journey. It's a very oh. old quilt. Oh, wow. So it probably, so what would have happened was the dyes that they used might've had some oxides in it. And so it's actually a lot of the fabric itself has just degraded. And you can see as you get up close how heavily I quilted it to hold it all together, but the fabric is just falling off. Wow, so it's there's not even a been, hole in the top left corner, right? Yeah, so it's not been over dyed or bleached oh. or anything. It's actually sort of the, the, the quilt, the quilt mystique of its own. Um, it's which, almost which like you quilted so it by quilting it. That's cool. Yeah, and so now kind of giving it that extra life uh, by 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 um, adding all of those quilt stitches to holding it together. Mm -hmm. But I mean, and you can see where the old hand quilting was, where that part didn't degrade <laughs> because it's all kind of held together. That's good proof that your technique of quilting it is going to hold it together too. Oh man, if 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 stitching it holds it together, this thing is going to outlast the roaches. <laughs> because of how much I quilted it. <laughs> All right, so number four, Anne Marie, you ready? Tell us about it. Sorry, I have like too many devices going <laughs> on here. Um, oh, wait, so, sorry. Okay, so you're only seeing one of me. Okay, let's one's enough. The other, the other Anne Marie. Oh. Uh oh. I'm looking for you. Sorry, sorry to make it complicated. <laughs> oh, maybe if I maybe if I share my screen, that I bet if I start sharing. Okay. okay.
Okay. That's wonderful. Sorry about that. Oh, whoops. Sorry, I've got now which is the screen and which is the which is Zoom. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, sorry. <laughs> sorry for the little glitch. Um, my name, bleh, my name is Anne Marie Bonneau, um, and I'm going to talk about cooking now. But you know, I'm seeing a lot of overlap here, which I hope you see as I give my little presentation. So I went plastic free 10 years ago after reading about plastic swirling around the oceans. Um, I had no idea that this was happen happening. So I told my older daughter at the time, we have to get out get off of plastic. And I had no idea how, I just said, you know, we have to do something. So Mary Catherine was 16 at the time and she did a bunch of research. The first thing she did was she did a plastic audit. So she did this for, I think about 16 weeks. You don't need to do, do it for that long if you decide to embark on one of these. And this is, these photos are on her iPhone 2S. So that's why they're not great. That's how long we've been doing this. And when we looked at what we were, you know, bringing into our home, it made it a lot easier to figure out what kind of changes to make. So you can see lots of yogurt cups. There's a styrofoam takeout container in the top middle, uh, lots of bags for frozen fruit and sugar and snacks, uh, some plastic utensils, you know, just sort of typical stuff. Whoops. And um, so, yeah, then we were able to figure out what kind of changes we needed to make. Now, from there, I started to pay more attention to all of my waste because you just, you become more conscious of, of what you're throwing away. And I discovered that food waste was a huge problem. And we throw out, sorry, about not throw out, but about a third of the food we produce goes uneaten. And so I found that pretty astonishing. Wasted food accounts for about 8% of global emissions. And to put that into perspective, the airline industry accounts for 2.5%, which is pretty remarkable. Because I think most people, when you're thinking emissions, you think transportation, not food. So we started with food. That's how we cut down our waste. We cut down the plastic waste and the food waste because if you waste less food, you're bringing in less packaging into your home. And you know, you just, you look at the whole picture. So we figured out where to shop. And there is one place that is the most economical place to shop. It's the closest to you. And that is your refrigerator. So before we go shopping, we look at what we have on hand. Now, ordinarily, most of us, we've been taught well, if we have been taught, when we decide what, when we're thinking about what to have for dinner, we pick a, re pick a recipe and then we shop the list of ingredients. Now, if you do that two, three times a week, then you bring home all of these little bits and pieces and you also have all of the leftover food. So that adds up to a lot of waste. I look at what I have on hand and then I decide what am I going to make? So kind of like, these amazing artists, quilters, right? They, you use what you already have instead of, you know, thinking, what do I crave? So you let your refrigerator dictate what you're going to eat. Then, you know, look at what produce you have on hand. You wanna eat the more perishable stuff first. Then look in the freezer. I freeze all sorts of food in jars. On the left there, I have some apple scraps and peels that I freeze until I have a bunch to make scrap vinegar. Oh, which I use to make a really nice wood dye. After I make the vinegar, I put steel wool in that and it makes this really nice dye. So um, that's another I scrappy thing. I have made scrap vinegar with your recipe and- Oh, you have? Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. It was oh, so great. much fun, yeah. Oh, good, I good. Yeah, the first time I made well. it, I was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's good stuff. I have some, I don't know if you can see, I have some 
pineapple vinegar brewing behind me. Um, I use wide, mar wide, bleh, wide mouth jars in the freezer. Those tend to work the best. Then I check the pantry, you know, what grains. These are some mystery grains on the right. Hey, Anne-Marie, I wonder, um, because we can't see you right now, if you float your mouse to the bottom left where you see a little video camera next to the mute, is that on or off? Would it be possible to turn your video on there? You can't see me. No. Okay. But do, I wonder if you can't because you're sharing. But if you kind of float your mouse around and that bottom left, Yay, we see you. Okay, perfect. Carry on. <laughs> that's weird. I don't I don't see myself. Okay, well, we can see you now. So that's wonderful. You can see me. Yeah. Okay, you can see me. Huh. All right. <laughs> um, so I, uh, yeah, we shop at the farmer's market. I bring my, my cloth produce bags, which I'm almost embarrassed to show after looking at these gorgeous quilts. But <laughs> This is my one of my fancier ones. They're super simple, but they do the job. Uh, bulk, now that's been a little bit harder during COVID because we can't bring our jars into most stores. Um, up in San Francisco, we can. Down here, I'm south of San Francisco. We can't, we're a different county, but, but soon. Um, even our grocery stores here have a lot of naked produce. So the stuff can be found. what to buy. So I started eating a lot more vegetables when I embarked on this journey. And, you know, I really, I just wanted to cut the plastic. I had no idea that my diet would improve, but it really did because I stopped eating highly processed food. It all comes in plastic packages. So after about two weeks, I realized, oh, I'm, I'm not eating that stuff anymore. And after about two years of this, now results may vary. Um, <laughs> I realized I wasn't getting sick. I used to catch colds and flus and that just stopped. Um, I eat a lot of fermented food. I think that plays a big role. These are some things from my pantry. You can buy bread in cloth bags at some bakeries. You can bring your, your bag in. Chickpeas are a zero waste food group. Uh, those are some of my spices. Okay, how to buy it. So as I said, during COVID, this is a little, a little tricky with the jars, but um, I haven't had any trouble bringing my uh, reusable produce bags to the farmer's market. I've been doing that. Well, I was stranded in Canada for the first part of COVID. I was stranded up there for about four months, almost four months. Um, and there were no farmer's markets at the time because I was in Canada. Uh, but yeah, once I got back here, I haven't had any trouble doing that and things are opening up. So, and my cooking has really changed. So I cook a lot of, uh, sourdough. I'm obsessed with sourdough. This is my, so I can't see myself. So I don't know. If, <laughs> this is my gluten-free sourdough starter. Her name is Teflonor. She's made of Tef, my gluten false sourdough starter is Eleanor. So I have Eleanor, she's in the fridge right now having a nap. I have Eleanor and Teflonor. Um, yeah, so I started making sourdough because I wanted to cut out the extra ingredient of baker's yeast. I wanted to use as few ingredients as possible. And I knew that I could make bread with wild yeast. I just wasn't sure how. So I finally looked into it and that was about seven years ago my starter turned seven this year I had one before her but she didn't survive it wasn't her fault it was it was me <laughs> uh so oh yeah there's Eleanor in the jar on the left and that's a loaf of sourdough bread it has flour water and salt and that's it because the starter itself is just flour and water that you nurture this is my um grain mill I also have an electric grain mill that someone gave me I had wanted one for a long time. And then my neighbor just one day said, here, I have this beautiful 40 year old wooden grain mill. I'm not using it anymore. So, and that happens to me all the time. 
when I think I need something or when I want something, it just magically appears if I'm patient. And sometimes I don't have to be very patient. But anyway, so uh, if you grind up the grains, it's a lot healthier because you get all of the nutrients that are in the kernel. You have to use it pretty quickly because it has oil, the little kernels have oils in them and those go rancid soon after you grind them up. And this is why the shelf stable stuff does not have all of those nutritious parts in it. Uh, the little jar on the white is the flour after I ground it up. On the other hand, you don't have to go all little red hen. You don't have to plant the grain to grow the wheat, to harvest the wheat berries, to grind the flour, to bake the bread. But if you're here at this, <laughs> you're probably one of the types who wants to get the grain mill. <laughs> so fermentation, I probably need an intervention. It prevents food waste because those lemons, for instance, in the picture, those would rot after, well, I don't know, lemons take a while, but they would, they would rot and go moldy and you'd have to throw them in the compost. If you preserve them, make preserved lemons, like I've got some in the fridge that are almost a year old. Oh, and there they are. Some preserved lemons on the right. On the left, that's some of my kimchi. It's really good for you. Uh, I have hibiscus soda on the left and some kombucha on the right, which I just drink as a treat. Uh, I don't guzzle the stuff. I think if you're gonna ferment, start with vegetables. I mean, start with whatever you want, but um, you know, vegetables are really super healthy. And freestyle cooking. So this is like my version of the quilts. <laughs> I just, you know, look at what I have and make whatever out of it. And, you know, I, I save a fortune doing that. I save time. I don't have to run to the store for one ingredient. I just, you know, substitute stuff within reason. I mean, with baking, you can't do that as much because of chemistry, but you can, uh, you know, I think boundaries like that, parameters, they, they make you more creative and you come up with just really more delicious food. So on the left, that is some pasta I made with um, leftover pumpkin puree from a pie. You can cook a whole pumpkin in a pressure cooker really quickly or in the oven. Uh, more slowly. This on the right is some pesto that I made from uh, fennel fronds. I roasted the fennel, you can see behind the fennel bulb, and then I made pesto out of the fronds. And at my farmer's market, you can get the fennel fronds for free. Most people don't want them. So the farmers cut them off and they throw them in a bin and people come by and take them for their chickens or I take them for my people. And oh, this is homemade tofu. So you make tofu even once, you will never waste a bite of tofu again that you buy. Um, it's not that it's a huge amount of work. It's, it's very similar to making ricotta cheese, if, anyone, if, if any of you have made ricotta cheese. Uh, but it produces a huge amount of okara, which is the soybean pulp in the top on the in left picture. And I put that in granola. Uh, I put it in biscotti, the biscotti on the right. That uses up quite a bit. I'm able to find something to do with it. Now, in the old days, well, in the old days, I wouldn't have made my own tofu. Although I have baked bread for a really long time, but I think homemade tofu is pretty hardcore. Um, yeah, in the old days, I probably would have just composted that, but now I have to find a use for it. So I do. Oh. And, and we're at the end. And that's my book, available where you buy or borrow books. Okay, so let me turn this. I'm sorry about my tech problems. Oh, no worries. We, were, we loved every bit of it. So uh, technology uh, be damned. It's been so wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, so I'll unshare my screen. Oh, dear. Stop share. Okay. 
So Anne Marie, I have this little quote running through my head that I'm just going to. The, I remember, uh, you know, who Carl Sagan is. I, you know, this sort of. Uh, oh God, uh, yeah. <laughs> obviously, um, Carl Sagan had this moment where he oh, said, wait, you know, "If you want to make a, if you want to make a pie from scratch, you have to create the universe." Uh, you know, like which I think is such a an interesting quote because um, it happens a lot in in kind of. Um, quilting or these kind of things where people say oh you know you you didn't make it you hired some help or oh you didn't dye your own fabric well you're not as sustainable but I think it's just so I think there's sort of diminishing returns so the idea that you know, like you said you don't have to grow your own wheat to make bread there's these like you you get to decide at what point in the art you want to work towards and you know uh, us as kind of um intentional makers we push everyone to go one step further but not all the way you know that idea that there's that we never can make anything from scratch just by the nature of of making sort of you know we all just kind of try to work backwards as far as we can go right and i think you know that zero really intimidates people hmm. and uh yeah so i think you just you just dive in I agree. I feel like it's more important to feel inspired than shamed. And, you know, if people here feel inspired to make one or five changes, that collectively is really powerful. And then you get to feel what that feels like and get excited and then maybe make a couple more changes. Right, oh, right. So I'm, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna. I was gonna ask you on on well, well nobody's watching. Well, there's just the the four of us here with nobody watching. Give us a little. Give us a secret. Tell us what you've bought <laughs> and thrown away. Like you know what? Like because I'm sure there was some point when you were stuck in Canada where you had to go buy like a plastic box of cereal or something. You know? Have you like where you said five years ago you went let no plastic? So I'm kind ten, of like ten. 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 Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible! Incredi just in that's incredible on its own. I have a million questions, but like, get, like <laughs> I don't know. Uh, like the zero is uh, I don't have, has it been zero for ten years, or did you have to have you bought any well, last? No, it's impossible to be zero. It's not. I mean, I have to buy these headphones. Whoops, you know, yeah. and they they came in packaging. It's it's in my closet. While I, <laughs> you know, I try not to be a hoarder. <laughs> um but i do you know i do have that in there and uh, i don't know i don't know what to, uh, i'll have to figure out what to do with that but um i i mean i i don't buy things i think you know i've written a blog and i've got hundreds of posts on there and i'm sorry there are two of me there are two of me on the screen here it's very no, you're just, fine. um anyway yeah so i have written hundreds of posts i've written a book um, you know, I, I think about this all the time. My firstborn has gone into waste management. I gave up my firstborn child for this. I was like, <laughs> here, take her. Um, but really, I could just say, stop buying stuff you don't need. I mean, I mean, I'm, not that it's all our fault either. I mean, that's, it's not. Um, the way our society is set up, you know, it's, we're all swimming upstream. But we can do, you know, we can make changes. So yeah, the we need, I mean, we need it all. We need yeah. policy change. We need individual change. We need all of it. So I kind of went off on a tangent there. Uh, <laughs> one like, so it's a, a similar oh, yeah. what what brought me to quilting was that like I finally at the age of 30 moved out of my mom's house and like I needed a blanket for on the couch when I was watching TV and 10 years earlier or so my grandma had bought a hand pieced log cabin quilt top that had never been turned into a quilt and my mom pulled it out of the Rubbermaid and gave it to me and said here this can be your blanket and that's when I you know, found some batting and found some fabric in a, you know, that I had been given from my former next door neighbor. And that's how I made my first quilt was I needed a blanket and there were the materials just nearby that I already had. And I think that's a kind of similar impulse that, uh, you know, part of why I thought it would be amazing to have you on is I have individually talked to Luke and Zach both about fermentation 
Luke is incredible oh. at making sourdough. Zach, oh. I gave Zach his first kombucha scoby. <laughs> oh. and like we, we are really into doing that kind of thing in the kitchen. And I have a photo of myself with Sandor Katz. And I listened to the whole 16 <gasps> hour mastering the art of fermentation on audiobook from the library. Oh. And I think there's just a similar mindset of once you start thinking, I can sew my own clothes, I can make my own blanket, I can do, fix my own elbow patch, that then you also think, what can I do for myself in the kitchen? Right. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we've been sort of told that we can't look after our basic needs. You know, don't, <laughs> oh no. You, I, or, and like, and that fermenting is dangerous and it will kill you. And, you know, I thought I worried at first that I would get sick or, you know, accidentally kill my family, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's very safe, but I think we've been, we've been sort of taught that we should leave the cooking up to the professionals and yeah, become that much more dependent on the corporations to feed us. I have this, I bought this really brilliant book. And I actually think, uh, Heidi, you might've suggested it to me. Um, it's called uh, Bake the Bread, Buy the Butter. And it's just oh, a yeah. book of recipes. And it has, but it also tells, like, for example, you were talking about the tofu and how you're like, maybe you don't make all the tofu you eat because of the amount of uh, waste and, and time and et cetera, et cetera, that goes into it. I just think it's really interesting to, you know, just that idea of, of, uh, the, a little bit of effort on the bread side, it, buku results, beautiful bread is, you know, not, not the hardest thing, but like tofu or like, you know, the reason it's, you know, making your own butter is just like, ugh, yeah, <laughs> you know, all yeah. of this stuff. Yeah, some things that, yeah, I, I'm not making my own butter. That's, well, you know, so I lived in an intentional community for 15 years and, and I got displaced because of COVID and anyway, but I loved it. And I think, you know, that's, we need community. So one person can bake the bread and then another person, I still don't think they should make the butter, but, but <laughs> if you have cows, if you have a cow, but you know, and someone else can make the kombucha and someone else can make, you know, whatever. And, you know, we all kind of live together in these small communities working together and I think it's the way of the future or maybe it's like going back to the past but I think as we mitigate the or navigate the climate crisis I think that's going to become really important because you know basically I'm doing this this is like my job now and so I don't make the butter but I do make the bread and I make the kombucha and I make the kimchi and I make the I don't know all these things behind me um, but it is sort of like my job now um and not everyone has the time to do that or uh, you know so yeah i think community if we need we need more of that i'm i'm 100 percent with you i think that's just the most paramount important thing uh ever and it also allows you to use more of your materials for example you know, we've got a, a farm just down the street from us that we keep all of oh. our compost for. We're not going to do compost just because we don't produce enough to make true compost. And, you know, we, our garden is not, it, it just, it wouldn't work for us to do it, but we have a farm that uh, bicycles over and picks up our five gallon bucket of compost every two weeks, Oh wow! Uh, which oh, is brilliant. Awesome. And I think that sort of that community outreach because they can use it and then the bulk allows them to be able to work better, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm fully behind you. Uh, you know, I was inspired, I think maybe two years ago, Zach, you were posting about how you were making your own handkerchiefs. And I recently, I bought some handkerchiefs because I had never really blown my nose in fabric before. And my brother has been making fun of me a lot for using my snot rag. But I tell you, it feels really nice to blow my nose oh, in fabric yeah, yeah. instead of in paper. I, like I, I, I bought a couple just because I thought like, let's see what the standard way is. But now I feel really excited to make my own hankies. And I know like my dad had handkerchiefs, my grandparents had handkerchiefs. Like, it's not even skipping a generation. It's just a blip where I didn't do it. Um, but I think- That's, Yeah. 
we have so many skills as sewers to make things like that. And so I love the produce bags that you were showing because most of the people who follow me and Luke and Zach on Instagram have the skill to make a produce bag, but did we know oh, we yeah. had a produce bag? Maybe not yet. And like, I feel really freshly excited that, wow, I want a hand sewn handkerchief. I never had one before. And now that's the way I like feel like my life is better with it. And also it's better for the planet. So things like that, I feel like are a really exciting question to think about like, what else can we make when we're sewing that we need? Yeah, a lot of people, their first question to me is how do you live without paper towels? And <laughs> my mother, my mom who's 89, who grew up without paper towels, she doesn't understand how I survive without them. <laughs> and you know you can use you can use a rag or you can you know you can use a kitchen towel if it's a really big mess I mean how often are you spilling food all over the place that you need all of these rolls of paper towels um and I, I sewed I have um let's see I bought my daughter a flannel sheet for her bed and it wore I bought it at the thrift shop and it wore out and you know that's really nice fabric so I just cut a bunch of rectangles out once it finally wore out and surged did a rolled hem around the edges. I think I did a rolled hem on my serger. And um, yeah, I use, use that for, you know, paper towels. Yeah. So my sister, she's a big sewer um, and she's a doctor and she sewed the covers for the examination bed in her practice. And then she just would wash them after so so great yeah that's super yeah there's that's super there's there's so many different there's so many things we take for granted uh i think like ziplocs and um paper towels and the one that really gets me especially when you're in the airport and there's those bathrooms full of 1000 people they rinse their hands and then they grab one two three four five six paper mm, towels yeah then, yeah that's oh, right my. every time i get sort of this little hunchback twitch because i'm like you guys don't even need one why would you need seven <laughs> like that. yeah i can't i carry a little towel in my bag just a little small one i went to a cafe for the first time in over a year a couple of weeks ago and I went, I had to use the bathroom and I remembered because it had been over a year. Oh, I have a little towel in my bag. So after washing my hands, I just pulled it out. And I thought, wow, that's, I just prevent, kept, you know, a paper towel or two out of the trash. Most days I wear a scarf. I'm real big on scarves. And so I just dry my hands on my scarf by the time I yeah. the store wherever it's dry. <laughs> I, I love flannel shirts. So, you know, I really, I could just wipe on this. Nobody would know. <laughs> well, Zach, well, I think you're paying attention to the chat. Are there some questions that we want to make sure we respond to? Um, also, Luke, what were you about to say? I was about to say that thing verbatim. I was going to say, Zach, I think I saw you uh, start to respond to questions. So let's pull it open to Q&A. Well, we don't have a long list, but I did see there was one about, are any of us teaching young people about zero waste? No, we're doing it right now. That's, <laughs> we're, we're doing it. <laughs> Let's see. what else? I've, I, I've gone to, into schools and they're really into it. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see. I think the last time I did it, they were a grade four or five class and their teacher was really smart. She had me come in the day after they went to her to a recycling plant. And I said, so what did you see? And the one girl, she said, like her eyes just lit up, you know, not lit up, grew. And she said, so much plastic, mountains of plastic. So the, and uh, yeah, they, I mean, they're all into it. That's great. And Marie, what would you say for somebody who's wanting to get started using less plastic? Like, what are some of the easy go-tos for getting started to get it out? Well, cloth produce bags. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I've been using 
cloth shopping bags for over 20 years. I have one that's actually, it's older than my daughter and she's 26 <laughs> and I still use it. Um, but I was still using plastic produce bags. So we're all used to using the cloth shopping bags, I think by now, but then, you know, we put all of those in. So that's an easy switch, makes a huge difference. I mean, if you're using five of those a week, that's 250 a year. So that's a big one. And then I guess it depends on what you buy. So I would just look at what you're buying. If you're buying bottled water, then, you know, stop buying bottled water. You're paying a fortune. It's, and they're sucking all of the water out of California, Nestle. <laughs> I mean, okay, I won't get started, but I mean, it's, it's just awful. So <laughs> bottled water, get rid of that. Um, so, but start with the big things. Like when I, when I give presentations, inevitably, someone will say to me, what do I do about my prescriptions? You know, they come in those plastic bottles. If you're down to, if you've reduced your plastic so much that that's your biggest dilemma, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. And you need your medicine. So there are a few pharmacies that are using refillable glass bottles. I mean, I think there's one in Montreal I read about. There are few and far between, but uh, so the big stuff. Do you ever have any issues when you go to a conventional grocery store and you, and you walk in with your cloth bags? <clears throat> because when you check out, you know, a lot of times cashiers oh. giving you the side eye for that. Yeah, no, you know what? I haven't. No. Nope. Uh, I think I, I gave some of my bags to a friend. Uh, she lives in a city just one up from me. And she said at the Safeway there, they gave her a hard time. This was a long time ago. Uh, but no, I've been, uh, even at a grocery store, I haven't had trouble. And my daughter, my younger daughter worked at a little, a little market uh, for a couple of years. And I asked her and she said, she just looks when people bring them, she just looks in the bag, no problem. She said, you have to anyway with the plastic because you can't really see the mm -hmm. code through the, yeah, no, I haven't had trouble. And I thought I, I would. Yeah, well, I'm thinking that if anything, it makes the grocery store a little bit more money because your produce might just be a little bit heavier than it would, would be in a plastic bag. <laughs> well, you can, oh, so you can, you can put the tear on it. How do you know you the tear? Oh, you, you weigh it. So you get, get a scale out and put it on the scale. And then, uh, yeah, you just divide by, you can put it, put in grams and ounces. Um, I use lightweight fabric and I just don't worry about it. <laughs> but if you buy, buy vanilla beans, this happened to me once at the grocery store, they're $150 a pound. And I put them in my produce bag and the guy rang me up and it was, I, I had a handful of beans in there. And he said something like, I don't know, 20 bucks. And I said, really? I said, can you take them out of the bag and just weigh them without it? And it was, I don't know, seven. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I don't usually buy things that are $150 a pound. <laughs> and then some stores will, if you bring a bag, they'll give you back, they'll get, take off a nickel or they'll automatically do a tear. They'll take off a tear of, you know, 0 0.06 or whatever a standard bag is. So lightweight fabric. Yeah, and somebody commented they really loved your eyelet fabric bag for the apples. I, I would think fabrics with eyelets in them would be exceptional for produce because it gives you a little bit of that airflow. Yeah, oh, did I show that one? Yeah, you this is a- comment they really liked it. Maybe it was in, yeah, this is a, not very, not very good for flour, <laughs> but yeah, lace that curtain. is true. That's a great idea. Aaron just mentioned lace curtains. <laughs> oh yeah. So there's, so you were talking about, um, you know, trying to find a place to take your stuff. Uh, here in San Francisco, there's scrap. I think it's called scrap. Oh, well, I have to look it up. And you can take just all sorts of stuff and artists go there. And, and teachers and they just, you know, take all sorts of things. Um, but there's also, a, if you're looking for fabric in Sunnyvale, which is just down the street from me, 
there's a place called Fabmo, and it's amazing. They collect all sorts of fabric and carpet and tiles and all this stuff that would go to landfill. Designers donate it to Fabmo, and you can go in, it's free or pay what you feel. And they just, they keep tons of stuff out of landfill. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I'm inspired to make some produce bags. Mm -hmm. Me too. Well, I'm inspired to sew. You guys are, you're amazingly talented. I'm so impressed and you're, I'm just so inspired by listening to you. Well, but one thing that I was really hoping to get out of this conversation and I have is the, the, the Luke, you said cross-pollination, right? The connection of where the, the sewing studio meets the kitchen. And I love that image of you opening your refrigerator to see what you have to work with to make dinner. Because as improv quilters that are working with re repurposed materials, I see Luke and Heidi nodding, that's how we do it. Like I open my stash drawer over there to see what I have to work with. And then I make do. Just like you yep. do when you're making pasta out of pumpkin puree. You work with what you have and you might stumble across something that turns out to be a really beautiful and elegant solution. Yeah, but yeah, I think so. I love making I, the contrast between that and being a painter. Because if you're a painter and you have two dozen tubes of paint, you can mix them to make almost any color that you want. Mm. And you can get that exact shade of green that you're looking for. And when you're a quilter, you can't mix two fabrics together to make the exact same shade of green. You have to come up with some clever solutions. So, you know, do you like sew it together and whack it up enough that it pixelates like a, a pixel, you know, um, a pointillism painting? Or do you just use the shade, like some of the one shade of green over here and the other shade of green over there? But I think just, uh, you know, it's a really easy concept to wrap your brain around the difference between making art with tubes of paint that you can mix and a quilter who will always have the limitations of the things they have in their stash right now. It can never be as infinite as paintings. Someone earlier made, maybe Luke, when you weren't on, made a comment about comparing your work to Robert Rauschenberg and the way that he works with found materials. And I know um, he's really inspired me a lot. And similarly, there was a talk maybe a decade ago between an expert on Rauschenberg and Mark Bradford. And the two of them were talking about using found and repurposed materials and how inspiring that was. But I don't know if we can find that comment or question so Luke can respond to it. But I wonder if you have any thoughts about Rauschenberg. Oh, boy. I mean, uh, uh, plenty, um, mostly good, <laughs> uh, mostly really good, um, you know, and, and that's, and that's all something I'm happy to certainly discuss if anybody wants to kind of find me through the intertubes or, you know, to kind of talk deep art theory in that, but just the, the sort of topical idea of, of found objects shoved into your work. I mean, Rauschenberg absolutely just literally glued things together that he found. So like, it's, it's very kind of, one to one with um, the the material of his experience into the art, uh, and and I think that's really uh, really really interesting. And so so it's it's very kind of freeing in the sense of like, do you like something? Put it in your work, you know. Especially within quilting, I would say, you know, do you like something and it's fabric? Eh, but you know, I'm not telling anybody how to how to, you know, staple gun their things together. But, but I think there's so, so many, uh, there's such a freedom there of saying like, if you like something, figure it out. And I think that's so um, interesting and it can be freeing and yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like how it's instantly relatable too. There's a quote that he has about being, with a blank canvas, you're the master of the universe. And if you are starting with, a newspaper as your background and you're collaging and drawing on top of that, it grounds you in reality. And I think, you know, we have felt like we're the master of the universe, eating strawberries in January and, you know, getting things from the other side of the globe and uh, being a little more grounded 
in reality, I think is, is so comparable to that fridge photo that Anne-Marie showed. Yeah, I um, so my degree's in English with a concentration in creative writing. And I remember one exercise we did, I have to find what I wrote because it was, it was like, it was good. <laughs> Our teacher could have said, okay, here's a blank piece of paper, go write something. And I would have written crap, <laughs> but she gave us this exercise and it was write a story, 10 sentences, first sentences, 10 words, second, nine, then eight, seven, six, five, four. And just being forced to use those parameters, I came up with something really good. So That's I like think when I have to write an artist statement in 200 words or 100 words, I write the big thing and then I, oh yeah, and, then then it yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's always yeah, better yeah, yeah. shorter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think like you were saying, we, we can have those strawberries. And I mean, here in the US, well, in Canada too, well, uh, lots of other places, but we can have what we want when we want it. Mm -hmm. And I think that just sort of stunts your creativity and uh, robs you of your resourcefulness and really like your resilience. And, and it detaches us from the natural world. We don't appreciate Oh, this. yeah. How, yep. How things yeah. work around. You know, yeah. I think actually a great sewing example that I didn't think about till right now, but when I first was getting into sewing and looking at, oh, what if I don't use the really thin half polyester hand quilting thread from Joanne Fabrics? What other options are out there? Because I want my hand stitches to be more visually noticeable with a thicker thread. I was seeing a lot of people online talking about sashiko thread. And I thought, my goodness, where can I even buy that? Certainly not in you know, Illinois, where I lived at the time. And when you buy it, it's these teeny little packs, like maybe 10 yards in a little plastic package and it's shipped from Japan. And I thought that doesn't seem very authentic. Like there's nothing about Heidi Parks that's connected to the, that thread from the other side of the world. And I thought, well, what I have at my house cause I like to crochet is Aunt Lydia's crochet cotton. It doesn't come in as many colors as this DMC, but I use it a lot in the colors that I can get. And that doesn't have a plastic interior, it's cardboard. Mm -hmm. And Aunt Lydia's feels so like Wisconsin to me. And it's at my local store and it's easier to get. And I think like for me, maybe that's the comparison to exotic out of season strawberries is like, I love mm. using Aunt Lydia's and it doesn't have the packaging problems that the pearl cotton has. And it's a really exciting material to be able to work with because of its proximity to me and who I am and that like I already owned it before I became a quilter. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's been, yeah, me side, too. there's been a little side conversation and then maybe we'll we'll start wrapping up about does anybody have any good tips for shredding fabric we i don't i've tried rotary cutters slicing it that works fine for small batches but people are thinking about using for filling of pillows and cushions and things mm. and it doesn't take long of doing this for your wrist heidi you know yeah. oh yeah right? mm -hmm. it'll kill your wrist it'll kill your wrist so if anybody has any good ideas about that that's been a hot thread in the chat lately? Mm. It's a good question. I know yeah, I have, yeah, it is. my rotary cutter is one where you grip it. Like there are other ones where you use your thumb or your index or you like, wig, like I have a very ergonomic uh, rotary cutter, which would make it slightly more possible. I wonder if you could use a paper shredder. You know, so there was a time where I really mm. wanted to, thinking about zero waste, yeah. get rid of batting altogether and start shredding my fabric scraps and using that as batting. Mm. And so that's when I was doing all this cutting and killing my wrists. And I looked into a paper shredder, but apparently, I mean, maybe if you got a really nice expensive one with a heavy duty motor, it could work. But most paper shredder experiments I've seen people try online didn't have good reports. Mm. Mm. 
I also, think there's also, a company why not, that you can. Oh, sorry. Like, yeah, well, no, 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 shred no. It. <laughs> what it? What if you don't shred it? Would it be so bad as a pillow if it's not shredded? Uh, this, I, this is pretty comfy. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to fluff it up, but I. It's just made with all of those little ends, so it's a little bit lumpy, but. So not I, shredded, I don't know. But just thin scrap. You know, yeah, just the little bits. You know, when I serge a piece of fabric, just the little strips, all of those little bits, they pile up. And so my cat liked that, liked it. He moved I, out. He moved out yeah. during COVID. But so now I'm using it. I already separate my, like I put my thread scraps in one ball jar and I put my other little scraps in a different ball jar. And then I, the bigger scraps, I just put in the cedar chest. And so then I kind of naturally have three different sizes of scraps. If you're working towards making something small, maybe just have two receptacles where you're catching in the moment the right size, but it's a wonderful question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. So and again, kind of like you're that would be nice like to have a service. Not all of us need to buy industrial shredders for our homes. Let's have right, one. Right. Yeah. Well, so my daughter, um, when she was home, she came home from the long weekend. The, she's my older daughter who works in waste management. She's a recycling outreach coordinator. I think that's her title. So her agency takes fabric. But I asked her, what do you, what happens to it? And she said, she's not sure. She's only been there less than two months, I guess. Um, she thinks they shred it, mm -hmm. but I don't know. So some, some places will take fabric, some, uh, some recycling yeah, organizations. By municipality, from my understanding that some will shred to use for like industrial construction filler and things like that. Mm -hmm. Other places will just, pack it up in bulk and ship it overseas Yeah. for them to do something with, which is kind of another issue, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Have we solved all the problems? <laughs> Have we Not yet, but problems? we may be ready for some fresh <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs> um, well, this, that you'll then use more. to dye your fabric. Yes, exactly. And then I'll use the grounds to dye some more fabric. <laughs> Perfect. Lately, it's been mint tea from the garden. I have so much mint growing. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Anne-Marie, thank you so much for joining us. This was such an inspiring topic. I think a truly different lens to look at sustainable sewing than what we did last month with repurposed materials. And it was just so exciting. And after having made so many recipes from you and... I have made my own tofu actually. Uh, <laughs> it, this was just a real thrill. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Heidi and Zach and Luke. <laughs> I was so inspired by your work and your presentations and just, wow, <laughs> you're, you're all incredible. Well, that's very kind. Thank you so much for coming. I have so many more questions about kitchen stuff. Cause like Heidi said, I, you know, we're, we're all dabblers, uh, and, you know, <laughs> from da far past dabbling, I should say. So I've got a million more questions. Maybe I'll pick up a couple of copies of the book and I'm really excited to, to have this engagement. So thank you for your time. And oh yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah thanks for having me. Um, you Thank know, you everyone I, for coming. I know I'm going to be inspired the next couple weeks and it sounds like everyone else will be too. So please make sure you guys tag us as you, you know, if you do something cool and if you put these ideas to youth, tag the four of us. We really want to see what you do and use that sustainable sewing hashtag to share and definitely leave some comments when we post on YouTube comment there so we can really keep the conversation active and go in and and if you liked the talk share the recording with someone else inspire them too yeah thank all right the group hug everyone thank you so much <laughs> thank <laughs> you great morning afternoon or day wherever you find yourself <laughs> bye thank you bye thank you everyone Bye, Belen.